Game 5 of the World Chess Championship between Carlson and Karyakin took place on November 17, 2016 in New York. And this is what happened. We start out with Carlson playing white, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. And for the first time in the match, we have a non-Lopez, uh, at least since Carlson played the Trompowski uh, in, the, in the first game. He played the Italian today. Now, this may have been a little bit of a surprise ploy by Carlson, because if you look up classical games, Carlson has only played the Italian twice. Uh, the Italian played in, in rapid chess much more often by the world champion, but Let's just say this isn't something that Karyakin's team would have been very deeply prepared for from the perspective that it's not something Carlsen features regularly. But with that said, Karyakin immediately played bishop to c5, and after castles, knight f6, d3, we were in nothing but a mainline Italian. Uh, here, the normal plans to explain what, what the dynamics are of this structure. Again, we want everyone to feel like they're learning from these games and actually understanding what's going on. The dynamics of this position with the pawn on d3, rather than the more aggressive, everyone knows the romantic Gioco pianos where the pawn pushes to d4 immediately, you start getting sacrifices. Or even in the Lopez where white plays c3 with the pawn on d2, intending to get d4 in one move, not two, taking advantage of the pawn being able to move twice on its first move. Those things really make sense to people because white is playing aggressively to open the center and try to get more space. If you have more control over the center squares, your pieces have more options and more options are more powerful pieces. But the Italian is, is not necessarily abandoning these ideas. That's what I want to make clear. The Italian is often seen as a little bit passive if you don't play the really aggressive Gioco Piano C3 variations. But there's always the potential to play for C3 and D4 rather than just developing the knight to C3. I think many players, when you see this opening at the lower levels, the very beginner levels, they're playing these moves because they're just developing for development's sake. They've learned that I need to get my pieces out and get castled and develop my pieces, and, and then I'll figure out what to do in the middle game. Obviously, we know that players at the highest level are never just developing for development's sake. And, and the point of these lines with D3 is, again, white wants to maintain flexibility. I'm not immediately going for the most forcing lines, but I still have the potential to play c3 and both expand on the king side, as well as expand in the center. And those are the main themes that black has to look out for in this game. Now, all that said, Carlson went away from the roads most normally traveled here when he played the move a4. a4 is a move that is very common in a lot of positions. Sometimes it sets up a trap. I'll give you a line just to show you. If c3 is played, and let's say even a move like bishop g4 comes in, looking good. Well, now you start to see the whole purpose of a4, and this is a very good pro tip trap you can put in your pocket. Sneakily, you've created a scenario where this bishop is going to run out of squares with the move b4 and a5. This is very basic amateur stuff. Neither one of these players is going to fall into this trap, but it is something to note that a4 doesn't just come with overall strategical goals of expanding space. It comes with a little bit of tactical trickery. Now, the other reason to not play uh, the main line, let's say c3, this is a move that was played by Carlsen in his game versus Aronian uh, from, from the Loven uh, version, Loven Belgium Grand Chess Tour of Rapid and Blitz. That game went with d5, captures, captures, and after knight b to d2, knight to b6, bishop to b5. Natural moves were made, but in the end, Carlsen didn't feel like he got anything as white, or at the very least, wasn't ready to challenge Karyakin's potential improvements over Aronian's play in that line. And I want to I want to point that out because, again, my goal is to give you guys real knowledge about these positions, and I want to provide a universal truth. Very, very often when C3 is played in Rui Lopez's, in Italian games, in any double king pawn game, it, it's, it, strikes, it strikes black often that he should play D5. And it, it uni this is a universal truth um, because C3 is a move that takes away the natural square for the knight. By definition, it slows down and creates a more passive development scheme on the queen side. And it's because of that that d5 is a very common way to react. Black looks for the opportunity to then open the center, get his pieces on the more active square, something he's a little more nervous to do because white's up a tempo in a lot of the sharp variations. And so if you don't understand all the theory behind positions sometimes, meaning you don't have your head in an opening book and memorizing variations, sometimes you can take concepts like that and apply them across the board and look for clues of how you should play a position. And this is one of those clues. When c3 is played very often, d5 is the best move. And that's another advantage to playing a6, sorry, a4, is that it's a little bit more risky 
risky for black to just rush ahead with d5 when white hasn't committed c3 with with this uh, knight losing that square so let's say this position becomes open very quickly in some positions like this now that it's open white might just develop aggressively and and look to just play open center chess with all the pieces on their most active squares i'm over generalizing just to prove the point that it starts to help us understand why one move led to another, but led to another by these by these two very, very great champions. So a4 is played, and then the move d6 is played, and after c3, did Karyakin blunder the bishop? And I'm about to give you a huge spoiler alert that Karyakin just lost the game in about 12 moves. No, that's not what happened. He played a6, and after b4, brought the bishop all the way back to a7, so nobody panic. Now Carlson played the move rook to e1. The most common move here in this position, or let's say the most aggressive move in this position, is the move bishop g5. This game, this move was played by Vichy Anand against Akara Nakamura, also from the Loven Belgium uh, Grand Chess Tour Blitz and Rapid, same tournament that I mentioned earlier. And after h6, bishop h4, we had some really crazy stuff start to happen with g5. The king became open. Things got weird. Hikaru went to attack town on the king side. I'm going to let you go ahead and look up that game between Anand and Nakamura because I don't want to ruin your fun, let you enjoy it yourself. But that's, that's a line that is, is much more sharp, much more opening preparation driven. We've seen a common theme in this match. Carlson's not interested in the most challenging opening theory because he believes he's the better player. He wants to get to positions that are flexible and dynamic and where you have a lot of room to play on, uh, not moves that challenge just what you've done at home. And, and that's why he plays this move, rookie one, which is also a very common move. It's also a very principled move because you put the rook on a file, anticipating that at some point the center is going to become open. Also a very good tip for beginners and, am and amateurs that sometimes they don't look to move their rooks until the open files are created. I hear this question a lot. What should I do with my rooks? And other people say, well, just wait for there to be an open file. Once it's open, you know where the rook belongs. And though that's partly true, the the master doesn't just put the pieces where, where they belong now. He puts the pieces where they're going to belong as the position evolves. And rookie one is a move where you develop a piece into the center, anticipating that at some point the center is going to change, the structure is going to evolve, and the rook is going to be useful there. So remember that. You want to anticipate what the best opportunities are for both sides and have your pieces ready to pounce, like a tiger. Like a tiger. Yeah, right. All right, so here we go. Knight e7 is played. Now, this is the first move that's a little bit different than other normal roads. Rook e8 followed by bishop e6 is a common move. Bishop e6 right away is a common move because a lot of times these double pawns are hashtag MBD, which is Italian for no big deal, which happens to be French for get a life. And, and in this situation with the F file being open and the bishop here meeting for a, for a one-night stand long-distance relationship, black is getting plenty of compensation for the double pawn. So, so bishop e6 is common. There are other moves that are common, but knight e7 is a little bit of an unorthodox approach, giving away a little bit of control over the center to bring the knight to the king's side. But, but Karyakin properly anticipates when the center is going to become open. And after the move d4, he plays the move c6, knowing that he can now prepare ideas where he gets to strike in the center just like white did. But Carlson goes for the same thing. He plays h3, a very common prophylactic move, especially if diagonals are going to become open. You don't want tactics to start occurring at the, uh, at the white king's expense on this very weak square. And so h3 is played. We get a capture. And now the, the big combination by Karyakin that really set the tone that he was going to grab the bull by the, hor by the horns in this game is the move knight takes e4. This is a center fork trick a move that is very common in a lot of positions at all levels of chess. When your opponent has two pawns in the center and you have this opportunity with the bishop on the, uh, the, the c4 or c5 square if it's white or black, this is a very common theme to look for, this center fork trick where you give up a piece temporarily with the idea of gaining it back and hopefully changing the structure for the good, opening your d file, creating more open lines for your pieces. It's a very common idea. Carlson knew it was coming, though, and so rather than just taking back and allowing d5, he decides to grab the f7 pawn, hoping to weaken the king. But really, when all is said and done, we're evaluating this position as one that is anything but an advantage for white out of the opening. I mean, if you look at black's two bishops, the fact that he has the f file, and the fact that white lacks any sort of really concrete... Uh, knockout blow against the black king whom he just gave up this bishop for to open it up the position is is just equal but but black has had a successful opening uh white white's going to make sure that those diagonals and files don't get out of control basically by putting the knights on very strong central squares which is also a good educational tip that the only way for knights to compete with the bishop pair in the open board is to be centralized your knights have to be on the most dominant central squares force them to either take you or to get a life 
It's what you got to do anytime you're playing the knights versus the bishops. And after h6, which stops knight to g5, just, just a basic threat, White's going to go for this idea starting right now with knight e5, forcing one trade. And then when he brings the rook to f3, he creates a whole bunch of tactical threats, forcing another trade in just a moment. Uh, this was sort of seen as a critical moment when, when Karyakin played queen h4 because it hit the b-pawn, it hit the f-pawn. And with the bishop pair, and you see all these pieces not directly having threats, but all centered around one area. I always like to say if you're a great white, you smell blood in the water, even if you don't see the prey. And, and this is an example of not just Danny drawing a bunch of colorful shapes and lines. Ooh, look at that. Just kidding. It's also uh, an example of where all these pieces might come together for a party if white is not careful. And, and so Carlson recognizes that. And like a true champion, he defends not with passive moves, moves that are scared, scaredy cat moves like queen d2 to guard this and guard this at the same time, a move like I would have played. He plays the most dynamic and aggressive way to defend, which is the best defense is a good offense. Rook to f3. Why does this work? Let's analyze exactly what happens here. After rook to f3 and bishop takes c5, what if he, what, what if after rook f3, bishop c5 hadn't been played? What if black deals with the threats on the f file and keeps the idea of the pawn in mind? Uh, one big problem, everybody, is that if this pawn is taken, white has this very strong move, bishop a3 with tempo and defending the knight, and then immediately white has threats of e6 coming. So that's why the pawn can't be taken right away. Just pro tip, FYI. Uh, but the best move, according to the engines, was this move, bishop g6. And after takes and takes, there are several ways white could have gotten counterplay, which shows Carlson was defending with best defense as a good offense. One is with some aggressive and craziness stuff with like e6 and then queen to g4. Maybe we get an endgame where the white pass pawn tells the, the majority of the story the rest of the way. But there's also this interesting idea of bishop e3, which sacrifices the pawn. White removes the knight with tempo. The queen has to retreat, and we get ideas like bishop takes a7 and then queen to g4. This move not only threatens queen to c8 check, but also e6. And suddenly again, you see white having a lot of coordination for the, for the cost of this one little pawn. And at the very least, this b4 pawn has served its purpose, right? He sacrificed himself for white to get a lot of attacking chances. And it wasn't what Karyakin was interested in. Probably because, again, psychologically, he's black in this game, and he's okay with a draw. He's the challenger, and every time a half a point occurs on the board, he gets closer to, to maybe pulling off the upset and, and actually beating Carlson in this match. So, so he played the more solid move to just take on c5 and eliminate a lot of these tactics. And it goes into exactly what I was saying, that the way that you would deal with the bishops is put your knights on center square so that they have to either give themselves up or get a life. That's what, that's what Karyakin had to do. He had to give up the bishop. And uh, maybe he got a life along with it. I don't know. I don't judge, right? This is a judgment-free zone right here in these videos. After rook to e8, we get rook f4 gaining a tempo. And the truth is most of these moves are pretty natural, especially to right here where Karyakin plays the move bishop e4. Very strong move. Hits the rook. Hits g2. Cuts off the rook from e5. This is good stuff. And note that any sort of passive way to play the position is the opposite of how you want to play an opposite colored bishop attack. If you get attacking chances against the king in an obstacle bishop position, chances are you make the other bishop irrelevant and you can actually succeed with chances that you wouldn't otherwise normally be able to with just a few pieces on the board, let's say. But, but bishop e4 is a move that's going to create attacking chances because of the opposite code bishop dynamic in the game. Well, whereas a move like bishop e6 would allow white to do the same. Now all of a sudden the table and, the, and the, uh, the script might be flipped where now white is dominating on the dark squares. So that would be a good example of exactly what not to do. Black played bishop e4, and after rook takes f7, queen takes f7, we got f3. White is going to do his best to defend against the potential attack on the light squares, but let's see what happens when Karyakin gets jiggy with it here in a moment. After king h2, bishop e6, rook e2, you might be thinking this game is just headed for a draw, opposite code of bishops, is there anything special? Don't don't go anywhere, okay? Because we're looking at a game that gave Sergei Karyakin a massive advantage in just a few moments with black. The point of why that happened is what I've been foreshadowing. He sort of slowly creeps his way toward a position where there might be real chances of attacking on, on the king side. And how does he do that? He starts doing that right now with the shocking move, king to f8. Where's he going with that puppy? What he wants to do is bring the king to b7. Why? Black's only positional weakness in the entire structure is the pawn on b7. And the only piece guarding it right now is the rook. Well, I don't want my rook guarding a pawn. I want my rook doing damage. So recognizing that he has an opportunity in a closed position 
a closed position where you normally can't get away with a king run like this, but here he can. He sees that if he gets the king to do a job that, you know, frees up the rook to be a little more nasty on the king side, this whole game might get a lot more interesting real fast. And after king f8, the problem is that Carlson just frankly got overconfident or underestimated that this idea was coming. He played queen to c3 and just sort of shuffled the pieces. And as soon as black got the king to c8 and that pawn was protected, things started to get very dangerous. Black plays queen to g6 with very clear intentions. I want to play h5 and g4 and create that obstacle bishop open scenario I talked about where your dark square bishop may not be that useful. How are you going to deal with it, big boy? My queen also has this diagonal and the light squares on the queen side may not be the easiest to guard either. Well, Carlson dealt with it the best way he could. He played G4. Uh, Hikaru Nakamura in our live chess center postgame show. Again, if you're missing these live chess center postgame shows, hashtag you problem. Uh, he, he suggested that maybe G4 was the, was the overly aggressive way to defend the position. Perhaps King to G1, H5, and then Rook F1. Just kind of buckle up and sit tight and actually see if Black can get it. I highlight the, the principles and these ideas of getting an obstacle bishop attack on the light squares. But maybe maybe the best thing to do is just to sit and wait, and if G4 is ever played, just take with everything, make a whole boatload of trades, and, and get a draw. But Carlson didn't want to do that. He played G4, maybe thinking he still had chances to cripple these pawns on the color of his bishop. But Karyakin, I was watching the game live, instantly smelt blood and played H5. He says, uh, what are you doing here, buddy? You just gave me the chance to open the H-file. If you take, I'm going to go shake and bake. Hashtag I helped with the shake and bake. And if you don't, I might build up on the H file and uh, and and go to go to town over here anyway. Black played queen to d2, but after rook to g7, just defending the pawn, king to g3, rook g8. Black is preparing as soon as he has a chance to switch, and open and crush. Suddenly, Carlson realizes he was under some pressure and and played a careless move, a move that he even said himself in the post game conference, a move he played with his hand, and not really his head. He should have played the move rook h2, anticipating his mistake and preparing that he might be able to just sit with the rook on the h file saying, let's play a game of chicken, let's have a staring contest, eventually we'll both blink at the same time, everybody will be traded. Instead, he played the move king to g3 last, as you remember, and now king to g2. No matter what, whenever you play a move like king g3, king g2, one of those moves was probably a mistake. It's either the move you made before or the move you're about to make. And as much as that's hard to see in a real game, because these players are literally just focused in the moment, it's pretty obvious afterwards that something was going wrong. And um, Karyakin didn't hold back. He took on g4, and suddenly he has the potential for a huge attack. He plays a very, very sexy move here, a move that may not have even been the best move, but it was still just sexy. He played the move d4, sacrificing a pawn to open up the square for the bishop and create threats on the light squares that that king is going to wish he never had to deal with. Is it possible d4 could have even been a little too fast? Because the idea is so strong, did he have to rush it? Maybe not. Queen h6 has been analyzed by a lot of people. I recommend, again, you go and check out uh, Grandmaster Robert Hess's analysis over on the uh, over on the chess.com main page where he writes a blog and does analysis for the news. I tried to bring up the image there to give Bobby some love, but you know what his face looks like. Go check it out. Uh, Bobby has some analysis there. Maybe queen h6 and then preparing both dual ideas of this and d4 were a, were a little trickier. But but d4 was still pretty good, and he still had the right idea in mind to make sure that this became a threat along with the h-file. And this has the makings of a Carlson loss. This smells like danger, right? Actually, danger's my middle name. That's what's going to happen right now. And uh, this is probably the, the moment where the entire match shifted and, and hung on the balance of a single move. In this position, one move is going to launch a massive attack against the king. The other move is going to allow Carlson to escape by the heron as chinny chin chin. If you don't know the result of this game and you don't know who's leading the match right now, you're about to find out. The move played in the game was the move that is the most logical follow-up to d4. You sacrifice the pawn to free the diagonal. You use that diagonal and you put a bishop there. Looks good, feels good, seems right. But Carlson had a counter shot that we're going to talk about, and that's how the game headed down an equal direction. The correct move was rook to h8 first. You sacrifice the pawn correctly, but now go build up on the h-file. The king will have to run, and as soon as your queen flips the script to the queen side, ask yourself if you want to deal with these threats as white. I got threats like rook h1, threats like bishop d5. If you do anything wrong, I'll just pick up the pawn I sacrificed. All kinds of checks coming here. Objectively, can you play this position as white? The computers say maybe. 
maybe you take on g5 and deal with rook h1 like bishop d2 and then you you start you start running your king up the board it's scary though and and certainly not what the world champion had in mind when he had the white pieces this was the opportunity for karyakin to really bring down the hammer on the h file unfortunately for the challenger he played bishop to d5 now why is that so bad it's just a simple move order change i still have all the permanent features playing to my advantage in this position. I have the light squares. I still have the H-file. Well, Carlson, he's a creative defender himself, and he proved he could play with Karyakin in, in the realm of defending worse positions. He played E6, exclam of Eoch, boom town. I think he actually said it, but like Carlson went boom. No, he didn't actually do that, he would, but wouldn't be cool if he did. He played E6. What does that do? It protects H8. So you could try to ignore it and go for this, but now you're now you're making an e7 pawn. I'm not getting mated anyway, as we saw, at least not right away. So as dangerous as it might be to run on the light squares, do you really want to let this pawn sit here? Hashtag no, Scott. So instead, Car Karyakin did exactly what he should do. He took the pawn, but that allowed Carlson just enough time to relocate the pieces, starting with king to g3, getting out of the pin, followed by the move f4, in just a moment, actually, rook h2 was better first because it threatens rook h8 trading pieces. Once that uh, once that gets dealt with because there's a threat on f3 check, Carlson plays f4, and Bob's your uncle. Everybody's getting traded. We got all the pieces coming off. Rook goes to e4, forcing the trade of rooks, and the draw was simply agreed because now we do have an obstacle bishop scenario that really can't be overcome. So to back up again, give you a little instant replay. Everybody loves that critical moment right here. How crazy would that have been if the challenger the massive underdog in this match won a game as black he could have been looking at a new world champion he missed his opportunity but he's got to feel good heading into the halfway point now having had his best game by far in game five and he gets two whites in a row because when the match flips at the halfway point he gets two whites in a row get ready for some interesting stuff everybody and you can look for the analysis here every time so again bishop d5 unnecessary as as intuitively logical as it seems the H-file was more important. Carlson did not miss his defensive opportunity. And ladies and gents, we have a world championship match. Because after all is said and done, we've seen five games. We've seen a whole bunch of equal play back and forth. We have two whites coming for the underdog. That's the challenger. Where can you find the action as soon as the game is over with? You can find it right at chess.com TV. Every game has something to look at and we will be reviewing every single one of those games at 5 p.m pacific the next one is friday november 18th we will be reviewing what happens live getting the expert analysis and then i will be doing these videos as i've been doing to bring you the educational tips that you can take home and put in your pocket thank you everybody for watching please continue to tune in let's help the chess world grow and just get excited about what's happening in this match it's closer than people thought it was going to be and uh, this game was a potential tide turner Carlson stopped the bleeding at the right time in this game and held on for the draw, but what will we see when the challenger gets two whites in a row? I don't know. I know we're going to find out next time. Tune in to the same bat time, same bat channel. Peace out, everybody.